Good morning. Good to hear everybody catching up from the week. I uh, love coming in here on Sunday mornings and just hearing everyone visiting with one another. That's just what makes part of the First Baptist Church family so great. Man, what a difference a week makes, right? Last week we were cold and miserable and they're at home and now we have a beautiful day to be able to come here and worship the Lord. So it's so good to see each and every one of you today. We're especially glad for our guests that have come to join us today. If it's your first time, we'd love for you to pick up a welcome bag at the desk before you leave this morning. Uh, also, if you want to text welcome to the number you see there on the screen, we'll get you some more information about First Baptist Church. Again, it's good to see everyone. Just let you know, as we're getting ready to hit the spring, we have a few uh, events coming on, some registrations that we've opened up. Our family retreat, we've opened up registration for that. That's gonna be in March. We'd love for you to come. Space is limited for that. If you'd like to sign up for the family retreat, you can look on the church app or the website. Also, we're gonna be planning a trip down to the Yucatan in Mexico this summer and we're looking for people who might want to join us for that mission trip this summer so if you want to pray about uh, spending a week of your summer in mexico uh, ministering there we would love to have you join us you can find out more information for that on our church app or our website as well uh, looking forward to a great morning of worship you know I'm just kind of standing up here sort of listening to the chatter you know, it, it's, it almost sounds like a family reunion. Y'all ever go to a family reunion and everybody just talks and talks and talks? You know, I think that's, that's a good thing. We're family. We're family. We're glad that you are come. You've come as a part of the family. The family of God to worship Him and to honor Him. I want you to just, to, I want you just to be engaged in worship today. Just express your love, you know. Uh, sing, sing out, sing loud. If you sing off key, it's okay. Blame it on the person next to you. <clears throat> but listen, let's, let's honor the Lord as we worship Him, as we give Him glory. Let's sing together.
my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! In sing my soul. I know I do all the time. It's something that we take, something that we take for granted. Probably when we come here, is that um, we're always going to have a chair to sit in. That's a, that's a reasonable thought, don't you think? There'll always be a place to sit. Well, if you if you look around yours as as you were coming in, you noticed that there were there were blue chairs kind of randomly placed throughout uh, the worship center. And uh, a lot of times, most Sundays recently, we've been having to put these chairs out, and they're in the back, and um, uh, they're they're back there, and they're really not as comfortable as some of these uh, of some of our padded chairs. Um, and so, uh, we we did that to call attention to something. There's a problem. Now, I'll, I'll be honest with you; it's a great problem to have. We need more chairs. We need more of the padded chairs because what, what we've been having to do is put out these uncomfortable plastic chairs and we just need more. Well, they're, they cost about, they cost about $100 a piece. And so we're looking for people who would be willing to give some money um, to help us buy chairs. It's not a budgeted item. And... Uh, so I just wonder if there are any, we're looking for about, I think, 50 chairs, and that's about $5,000, and um, or maybe, it's, maybe it's 60 chairs and 6,000, something like that. But if you, could, if, if you could talk it with your family and pray about it, if, the, if you could guys could give a, over and above your, your tithes and offerings, you could give an extra $100 for a chair. That would be a tremendous blessing to all of us, and th- for those of you guys uh, who, who come in late, you just you need a place to sit, and all the places up front are, are full. That's you know, by the way, that's not true. You get here early to get a back seat, you don't you? Uh, all these are empty down here, by the way. If anybody's looking for a place, we've got lots of places down here. But uh, anyway, thank you f- for prayerfully considering that uh, because indeed it is more than just a chair. It's more than a chair. It's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity for someone to come and be a part of the worship to hear the gospel and to respond to God's calling on their life. I hope, I hope that you will consider doing that.
God's got a calling on each life. You may have been a believer for the last 50, 60, 70 years. God's still got a calling on your life. Maybe that sense of, uh, you know, my, 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 my role here is done. I'm, I'm done. I've, I've done my thing. I've, I've taught my class. I've been a deacon. I've been a teacher. I've been a whatever. Uh, but time is over. Or maybe, maybe your thought is just on the other end of that spectrum. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just brand new here. I, I'm, I'm a new believer here. I, 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 God's got a calling on your life. God's got a calling for you to go and change, be a part of changing your world, your, your sphere of influence around you, to go and make a difference.
to go. You know, some, some young believers just get, just get saved, just get baptized, and the preacher says, listen, you need to go tell everybody you know about Jesus. They, they don't know any better. I think everybody's doing that. That's what we need to be doing. We need to have that, we need to have that desire that, that people need to know around us the greatest decision they can ever make, to, make is to know Jesus Christ as the Lord of their life. I pray that we would do that. You know, sometimes God calls us to do, do th- new things in different ways, and we're, we're, we're out of, that's out of our comfort zone. But listen, we need to be able to, willing to say, God, whatever, whatever you're asking me to do, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Whatever it takes, I want, to, I want to be a part of your will. You'd be amazed at what God wants to do in and through the life of the believer who just says, God, I'm yours. Use me however you said fit. God, thank you. Lord, thank you for willing hearts. Thank you for hearts who say, God, I'm, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to go the next step. I'm willing to give the next dollar. I'm willing to, to uh, speak to the next person, whatever it takes, God, to make a difference in the world for the cause of Christ. And Lord, you'll be, you'll be honored, Lord, in that. God, we love you, and we thank you in your name.
Amen. I'm breathing in your grace, and I'm breathing out your praise. I'm breathing in your grace. Good morning, church. It's good to be in God's house together this morning. And as you can see on stage, I feel like I should share this with y'all. In in first service, we had a young couple uh, got married at the end of last year. And this morning, husband and wife, they both got baptized. And so that's an incredible, incredible blessing. Yeah. But I tell you, in in first service, uh, as I was standing there worshiping, 
I was just praying and just basking in the goodness of being in God's house, being among God's, God's saints, uh, enjoying a time of praise and worship. And I was reminded uh, of this, of just how much I need this every single week. Uh, you know, missing, of course, I'm here every week for the most part because, you know, it's kind of how it goes. The preacher's usually at church. Uh, but when you miss, you just, there's just a hole in your week. And so I want to remind you, we say this all the time, how, how much of a blessing and a benefit it is to be at church. And certainly, I am included in that as well. It was just a tremendous morning and just reminded of my need to be here. In fact, uh, G.K. Chesterton once quipped, he'd been a Christian a few years, and an old-time acquaintance told him, you're a Christian? And he said, yeah. And he said, well, you're an awful, sorry person. I can't imagine you being a Christian. And Chesterton shot back. He said, well, imagine how rotten and horrible I'd be if I wasn't a Christian. And, and I feel that. I, I, I definitely get it. Now, this morning, uh, you noticed the blue chairs. I know uh, John mentioned this as well, but as I was coming in, somebody said, what's up with all the blue chairs scattered around the room? And I said, well, if, you're, if you happen to be sitting in a blue chair this morning, we're going to go Oprah on it. You get a car and you get a car. So uh, I don't know if you're sitting in a blue chair or not, but you're not getting a car. Um, but uh, we're working to, to raise uh, $6,000 for 60 new chairs. My, me and my wife and my kids uh, pledged together to buy one of those. And we're going to lean heavy on my son because he's the richest one in the family. Every bit of Christmas cash, he stuffs it in, in, in his pockets in his bank account. So uh, this morning, let me begin with a story. When I was probably around the age of 10, I uh, traveled with my, my parents to San Antonio and we saw the, uh, the Alamo. And I was excited. I was a huge fan of Davy Crockett as a boy and was excited to see the Alamo. And when we got there, I was underwhelmed by the Alamo. If you've been to the Alamo, say amen. You know, it's not a very impressive structure. Now, what they did there was impressive, but I remember as a 10-year-old boy being disappointed and thinking, man, I could have built this thing in my backyard almost. This is just a small um, little mission. And sometimes that's how it works where you, you, you build something up in your mind and you see it and you're let down by it. But sometimes it works the opposite way of that as well. And I can remember as a teenager traveling to the Grand Canyon, and I had only ever seen pictures of it. And I was expecting a big glorified ditch, like, you know, it's going to be all right. But when I saw the Grand Canyon and the depth, the vastness, the colors, I was just blown away by just the impressiveness of the Grand Canyon. Uh, same thing for me the first time we traveled to New York and I saw the Statue of Liberty. Um, you, the pictures don't do it justice and you walk up on Ellis Island and you look up at this grand, grand statue. And I was just sort of overwhelmed by how extraordinary it was but then there are some things that are so big that you can't really even wrap your mind around it or fathom it and I'll share one of those with you this morning we, we could have talked about this the week we talked about creation because it ties in so well and it has to do with just the the vastness of space and just the size of stars and, and galaxies. And we see, you know, pictures of the James Webb Telescope or the, or the Hubble, when it's beautiful. But our minds can't really comprehend just the vastness of it. And so did you know this? That between every star in our galaxy, the distance span there is 30 trillion miles. So if you, if you were standing on the sun, which I don't recommend that, but if you were to do it and you wanted to travel to the nearest star, you're looking at 30 trillion miles. And you hear that number and you're like, yeah, a trillion's a lot. But let me break that down for you, what that means. Suppose you could travel at the speed of sound. Speed of sound is pretty quick, 770 miles per hour. So if you could travel 770 miles per hour uninterrupted, you started at the sun, it would take you 1.3 billion years to get to the nearest star in our galaxy. Now, that's impressive, is it not? Let me blow your mind a little bit more and give you some context. The speed of light, if you could travel at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second, how fast is that? I feel like you should repeat something after I say that, but how fast is that? It's really fast. 186,000 miles per second. At 186,000 miles per second, you could orbit the Earth seven times in a single second. So if you could travel that fast from one star to the next nearest star in our galaxy, it would take you three years. Now that's hard for my mind to grasp how huge of a distance it is between just the stars and our galaxy. 
Now, the reason I tell you that is because this morning, what we're talking about is of similar effect. This morning, we're talking about grace. And grace seems like a supple, such a simple concept when you, when you sort of are introduced to it. But the more you think about it, and the more you try to understand the grace of God, it grows bigger and brighter and grander and more impressive and more beautiful. And so this morning, that is what we turn our attention to. And so as you know, we've been talking for the last several weeks about the Christian worldview. Well, let's review. What is a worldview? We said this, that a worldview is like, sort of like a pair of glasses that you put on. If you put on a glasses with a pair of blue lenses, you see the world in blue. If you put on a pair of prescription glasses, you take them off, maybe it's a little blurry, you put them back on, oh, the world is there in crystal clarity. It's the same way with a Christian worldview. When we have on a Christian worldview, it paints the world clearly. It helps us understand reality. And often we use our worldview just like we use our eyes without even thinking about it. It comes natural to us and that works two ways. If your worldview is off-center, well, you don't really notice it that you're using an off-center worldview, but your worldview, your your living, your understanding of reality is off-center as well. We've said this, that many claim to be Christians, but truly few have a truly Christian worldview. And so we've been looking at this grand overarching story, and we've been looking specifically at four categories, and we've looked at creation. We've looked at the fall. Today we talk about grace, and next week we're going to close out with the idea, the understanding of glory. But let me give you a little bit of perspective here. You know, when we talked about creation, we looked at Two, two chapters, Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Then not too far into human history, Genesis chapter 3, the fall takes place. And so in the first three chapters of the Bible, we go through these first two movements of creation and fall. Now in the remaining 1,186 chapters of God's Word, the whole thing is filled with grace and glory. But predominantly, the rest of the Bible is a story about God's grace. Now, in, in my Bible, on the very first page, I copied this down years ago. I don't know who wrote it. It wasn't me. I'm not this poetic. Uh, so I can't attribute it to the author. But here's what I have written down at the first page in Genesis. It says, We live in a world shattered. Each step re-echoes the sound of broken glass. Shards removed at first from aching feet but then finally tolerated, longing to recover the garden of gentle grass. And so we talked about that last week, that paradise was lost. And ever since then, whether we assent to it logically or not, mankind has longed to go back to the garden. We walk with aching feet, we tolerate, we've, we've learned because we don't have a choice to tolerate the effects of sin. But we long for Eden, for rest, for the good and the true and the beautiful. Now, here's the beautiful thing about this is Scripture tells us how we get back. Scripture tells us the way back, and it is only through grace, through understanding our need for grace and to receive it. Now, we should note this, that God has revealed himself to us in several ways, He has revealed himself to us through nature. And so you can look around when you think about the unimaginable vastness and complexity of our universe. Traveling so far to get from one star to another. When you think about, when you look at the complexity of all that God has created, there's something in us that says, oh man, this couldn't have arisen by itself. Something can't create itself, so it had to come here from somewhere. Creation points to God. It's a signpost, we've said. And also, even in creation, we can see the fall to some degree. Because we know innately we've messed up, that we've broken a standard, that we can't hardly sometimes keep our own standards. But that's where nature ends. We need another way that God has revealed himself to us, which is through his word, that explains to us grace and glory. 
And so as we looked at the fall last week, we said that we are sinners. And I don't want to spend too much time reviewing, but it's crucial because all of these these sort of movements, these categories within a Christian worldview, they piece together. And so I want to make sure that we, we, week after week, we're piecing all of these together in our minds. So we said that creation, we said that God created everything and he did it for his glory, but he also, as a byproduct, did it to please you and your eye for beauty and for just the amazing things we find in creation. We said from understanding creation, in that we find our purpose. That our purpose is to glorify God, enjoy Him, and in that life has meaning and purpose and a sense of morality comes from God. But we said we're tempted to worship creation sometimes because it's so extraordinary and we lose our way when we worship creation. And what do we mean when we say we worship creation? We mean this, that we put what God made above God. That we find fulfillment in what God made instead of in God. That we devote all of our efforts to what God has made instead of working to live for and to please God. We were created to give God glory. And then we talked about the fall and we said this, that we, Adam and Eve, mankind, all of us rebelled against God and we died spiritually. We died, uh, we're dying physically and if there's not an intervention when we leave this life, that we will spend eternity apart from God. We said this, that all is not right with the world, and Christianity, a Christian worldview, tells us why that is, because of sin. That sin always has a byproduct to it, and we said that it is death and destruction and difficulty. And we said that the fall led to the fallout, and because of that, there was guilt and shame and alienation between us and other people, and us and God, and just difficulty in life. And if you remember last week when we left off, we said we need a cure. And we need a way back. And so what enters into the picture there is what we're talking about this morning. If you have, if you're taking notes, our first thought this morning is the way back. It is what is grace? What is grace? Now we get our word grace from the Greek word charis, which appears about 150 times in the New Testament, mostly in the writings of the Apostle Paul. And I want you to see this morning as we ask what is grace, that grace is a part of God's character. Grace is a part of who God is. He's a gracious God. It ties in with his goodness, with his love, with his benevolence. But however, it's important that we keep a proper perspective and understanding of who God is. And so while he is good, loving, and gracious, he is also just and he also is wrathful. We see that in the New Testament, that he's true. We learn that part of who God is is that he is gracious and thankful. Thankfully for us, that is a part of who God is. So what is grace? Grace is this. It is God's unmerited favor on sinners. It's God's unmerited favor on sinners. That is to say, it is something for nothing. We didn't deserve God's grace, but yet he freely gives it. Now, here's the interesting thing about grace. Grace is what I most crave, desire, want when my guilt and my sin and my shame are exposed. When I mess up, I plead, I desire, I want grace. My kids do this too because, believe it or not, sometimes they mess up. And when they mess up, what do you think they want, the wrath of dad or the grace of dad? It's always a plea for grace. So when I, my shame and guilt is exposed, I want grace. But on the other hand, I notice this in my nature. When other people fall short, when other people wrong me, guess what I'm hesitant to extend? Often, it's the very thing that I receive from God, which is grace. You know, and I believe when grace is correctly applied, it solves so much. Really, it solves everything. Now, you can't, you you can ask for grace. Somebody can extend grace, but you never deserve grace. When it comes to God, we, what did we deserve? Well, we learned from last week in the fall that we deserve God's wrath, that we deserve God's judgment, God's punishment, because we messed up and are separated. But God freely offers and extends grace, and grace is unmerited. You can't deserve it. It's, un, it's unearned, it's undeserved. Now, when you open the New Testament, one thing you find Jesus attack is graceless religion. Graceless religion. 
And sometimes I wonder if that is us, not wanting to extend the grace that God has given to us. The people who crucified Christ, they claimed to know a lot about God, but they didn't know a whole lot about grace. Now, some people will say this, and I've, I've heard this multiple times, that grace is a New Testament idea because the Old Testament was all about law and judgment and wrath. But what do we know about God's nature? Well, James tells us this, that God doesn't change, that God is the same today, yesterday, tomorrow. And so God was the same in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. Now, there are wrathful and, and just moments in the New Testament. They're in the Old Testament. There's, there's grace and love and kindness in the New Testament. Guess what? It's in the Old Testament as well. Let me read a verse to you. This is Revelation 13, 8. And Jesus is referred to by John as the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. The Lamb who was slain before the creation of the world. That is to say, before the Bible was written, before the Old Testament, before Abraham was called out to travel to a new land, that God had a plan and that his plan was and has always been that he would restore us to himself through grace. John 1.14 tells us that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Now, I want to make sure we get this understanding. Grace does not dumb down or water down sin. Because sometimes we think, well, you know, if you, if you give somebody grace, well, you're just letting them off the hook. No, no, no. Grace doesn't dumb down. It doesn't excuse sin to make it easier to swallow. Grace acknowledges sin completely, yet it doesn't condemn. Grace acknowledges sin completely, and sometimes with sin there's consequences, but it doesn't condemn. And so this morning... We're going to look at that grace, and we're going to talk about the way back. So thought number two this morning, if you're taking notes, let's take a look at the way back. You know, we call the gospel the good news because it's the story of the way back to God. It's the story of the way back to Eden where there was that intimacy between man and God. And so we've sinned, we've fallen short of God's perfect goodness, we have this sin disease we left off there last week saying we need a cure. Let's talk about the way back. First thought I want you to see is this. I know this is bad English, but we got to get it right. We have to have a correct understanding of what it means to be restored to Christ. You know, if you have an illness, you have to have the correct medication to deal with that illness. Or you're going to remain with the problem that you have. So let me read what Paul says to you. This is Galatians 1.8. And he says, but if we... Paul himself, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you before, let him be accursed. Now, this is what Paul's saying. He's saying, if, if, if Paul says, if me, myself, an angel from heaven, anybody else preaches to you a gospel, that's a false gospel, let them be accursed. Accursed, Paul is speaking of uh, spending eternity in hell separated from God. Really strong words. Because thinking wrongly, trusting in the wrong thing has consequences. You know, you can be so sincere in your beliefs, and that's great, but you can be sincerely wrong in what you believe. And so we have to have a right understanding of what is grace and what is the gospel. So what is grace? Well, I want you to see as we move along that Jesus is the culmination of grace. That Jesus is the full embodiment of of what grace is. Now, here's what the New Testament teaches. You know this verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he did what? That he sent his son. And so the father, from grace, he sends the son. But then 1 John 3, 16, I like how those verses are kind of tied together. It says this, by this we know love, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. And so God sent the Son, and the Son willingly came and did the work and will of the Father. Jesus did what Adam could not do. Remember last week we said that Adam and Eve sinned and, and man fell? Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life. And so for Jesus to be able to pay for our sins, number one, he had to be fully God. Because only God could atone for the infinite sins of all of mankind. He had to be fully man. That is to say, he had to have the same nature as we have to pay the debt that was owed for man. And he had to live a perfect, sinless life because only someone who was sinless could die in the place for someone who was sinful. 
And so think about this. Jesus endured all the pain of sinful humanity, all the troubles, the difficulties that we go through, pain, suffering, rejection. Jesus experienced all that. And when I suffer, I'm reminded that I also serve a suffering Lord. We can take comfort in Christ during those moments. But Jesus died willingly in my place. That is to say, I was destined to die, to remain dead spiritually, to die physically, to spend eternity separated from God. But Jesus willfully took on that punishment onto himself that I might experience the grace of God and also experience life everlasting. Paul says it this way, 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, for our sake, for your sake, for my sake, he made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. And after this, he was placed in the grave, as we know. Three days later, he arose, validated who he said he was, validated the claims that he had made, had, lot, had power over life and death. This is the culmination of the grace of God, that Christ would pay for our sins because we couldn't do it ourselves. We couldn't earn the grace of God. We didn't deserve it. It is the unmerited favor of God. Now, I want you to see this, too. That salvation for us comes through grace. That the way back is always through grace. And I want you to see a familiar verse, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We, it's been a while since we've looked at Ephesians, but we've looked at the whole book together. I want to revisit just one, two passages, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Paul says this, For it's by grace you've been saved, through faith. This is not your own doing, it's the gift of God. Not the result of works, lest any man should boast or brag. Now, how are we saved? By grace. What is grace? It's the unmerited, undeserved favor of God. And so we're saved by grace. How? He says, through faith. What is faith? Well, faith is simply trusting that Christ is who he said he was, that he came, that he lived a sinless life, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead. It's trusting the promises of God that if we confess our sins, acknowledge Christ as Lord, repent of our sins, trust the Lord that we can become in good relation with God again, that we can be restored, that he'll forgive. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. He says it's not your own doing. You can't save yourself. You can't fix your problem. I can't fix my problem. I need a cure. Salvation is the gift of God. You don't work for a gift. It is something he freely bestows upon us. You don't earn it. You just accept it. He says, not a result of work so that no one may boast. Our salvation doesn't come by doing good things. It doesn't come by going to church. It doesn't come by being baptized. It's not like our good and our bad is placed on the scale and your bad is way down here or way up here. And you have to add to your good, your good, your good, your good, your good, your good, your good to balance out these scales. You can never do it. Because all it takes for us to be separated from God, Scripture says, is a single sin. No one will get to heaven and say, yay, I did it, I made it on my own work and my own effort. It's only through grace. Now, as we've looked at these different areas in this grand story, creation and fall, we've asked this question, how do these categories help us make sense of reality? How do these categories help us understand the world around us and who we are and who God is? I want you to see the first thought is when we look at grace, it it helps us truly make sense of our lives here on earth. When we come to Christ, when we trust that God knows best, we humble ourselves and say, you know what, you, you, you know best, Lord. Life begins to make sense. As God changes us daily, our minds are transformed. The book of Romans talks about the renewing of your mind. We begin to see with clearer eyes. We gain understanding that when God says live in a certain way, that there's blessings that come with that. And a large part of that is peace. In Philippians, we talked about joy. That as Christians, our life looks very, very different because we have this understanding of who we are and that we've been set free from our past and our sorrow. It gives us a clear, again, a clear framework for our ethics and our morality. What else, how else does grace help us to understand reality? Well, we understand that there is a solution to the world's problems. You know, last week we said this, that the world is not right. There's, we look around and we see all kinds of horrible things go on in our culture. Sometimes we look in our own hearts and what do we see? 
We see horrible things that go on in our hearts as well. Now, even though we might feel discouraged when we look at the world, we have to understand, we can understand as a result of grace, there's a way back to Eden. There's a way back to God. It means this. It means people can change. It means that you're not locked into the place that you're at. It means you, doesn't, you don't have to continue to live in brokenness and shame and in guilt. It means people can change. It means we don't have to live in hopelessness. It means that history is marching to a better place. We'll talk about that next week when we talk about the glory that awaits. How else does this aspect, grace of a Christian world, do you help us make sense of reality? Well, it's in this that we truly find an identity. You know, people all around the world are trying to figure out, who am I? What is life truly about? Christianity answers that for us. When we come to understand who we really are and who we were meant to be, that is, we were broken sinners, redeemed by God's grace, it starts to reveal our purpose in life. What was it from the beginning? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And in this, we find our identity not in stuff, not in accumulating power, not in the creation around us, but in Christ. And with that identity... We live out our purpose in several ways. And this is what I want to talk to you about for just a few minutes as we're nearing time to close. Just to say, you know, when we respond to the goodness and the graciousness of God by living for Him, it shows up in various ways in our lives. Now, why do we live for God as Christians? Why do we do that? Is it because, well, God's been really good to me, so I guess I ought to try to pay Him back? That's not how it's supposed to work. We don't live for God out of a debtor's ethic of, man, I really owe God. For me, and I think the way that the Bible would have us to think about this, is we live for God because we love God. We live for God because how could we not, when he's done for us what he's done for us, he's changed us, he's given us a new mind, he's released us from the shackles of the past, he's given us a future and a hope. We live for him because we love him. And because we want to celebrate his goodness, and that shows up in our lives as we live out our identity and our purpose in a couple of ways. Let me share some of these with you real quick. The first way we live out our porpoise, our porpoise, that's like a... (laughs) um, (laughs) The first way we live out our purpose is we restore the ruins. Now, paradise was lost. And this is what I think is fascinating about living as a Christian is we work to restore that. Now, we won't fully restore it. That's the work of Christ through us. He will fully restore creation when we get into glory, when we see what's going to happen when he returns. But in the here and now, I work to make the world around me like it was in Eden. I'll give you an example. Uh, Thursday night, Hayden had his school done for Friday, and I was up working. The girls were sleeping on the couch. It was about midnight. And I was working on my laptop, and Hayden said, Hey, Dad. He said, you want to watch, my kids watch the most random stuff, let me tell you. And he said, you want to watch this guy restore this 40-year-old motorcycle? And I mean, this thing was rusted through, it was a bucket of bolts, it was, I was like, yeah, I want to see this guy restore this, I don't think it's possible. So I'm working, we're watching, and this guy takes this motorcycle apart, bit by bit, every single part was disassembled. And he cleans it, and he does all this crazy stuff to it. Even down to the bolts and the original screws, he restores those. And the end was this fantastic, beautiful bike. And Hayden and I were just kind of dumbfounded by it. That's sort of our calling as Christians, that we repair the ruins. And when we live out our Christian worldview, we sort of move back a little bit to Eden. Let me give you some examples. When we forgive someone who wrongs us and we restore a relationship, that that is an echo of Eden. Because that relationship is brought back in harmony. When we worship together, it's like we hear the footfall of the Savior in the garden once again. When we treat people with kindness, when we take care of our bodies and God's creation, when we bask in the good, the true, the beautiful, when we give generously, when we stand up for truth, all of that is us working to repair the ruins. How else do we live out this area of of a Christian worldview? Well, we live out our purpose through what's called the cultural mandate. That is to say, we work to change things in our culture that we know are damaging to people. That's why Christian, this, word, this phrase should never come out of a Christian's mouth. Well, you just do you. 
You just live like you want to. Well, it's true that people can, but I can't celebrate when people are embracing ideas and behaviors that are damaging to them. Now, I can't stop them, but what I can do is live out this cultural mandate to try to help the people around us think correctly. And we should strive to do that. Christians should have influence in society. But here's where we get it wrong sometimes. Because sometimes we think if we're going to change society, that we've got to get a bunch of Christians in government, and then that's what's going to do it. Now, I am not opposed to Christians filling office. And as a matter of fact, if there's a Christian, a true Christian running for office, I will vote for them every single time. But I want to rewind 2,000 years because the early church and the apostles, they had this much political power. And yet the world was changed through the early church and through the work of the apostles. Why is that? Because they leaned on the power of Christ to change the culture around them. In the early church, they didn't say this, look what the world is coming to. Instead, they lived by this mantra, look who has come into the world, Jesus Christ. And that is what changed the culture of their day. How do we live out our purpose? We do that last by sharing the cure. Now, Christian, I I can't press this upon us enough. That part of our divine calling as believers is that we share this cure that we have for what is wrong with the world with every single person we come in contact with. Every single person we come in contact with. Evangelism, that is sharing our faith, is a job we are all commissioned to do. How do I know that? Matthew 28, 18 through 20. The good commission. Not the great option. The great commission. It's a charge. It's a commission. We are to do this. Jesus said in these words, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all All that I have commanded you, and behold, he reminds us, if you're scared, frustrated, don't know how to do that, that I am with you always to the end of the age. If we truly believe that we have found a cure for our problems, and we hoard it, and we keep our cards close to the chest, how mean and horrible people are we? It would be like this, me walking into a children's hospital And knowing that I could fix every kid in that hospital and me not being willing to go have some conversations. If we truly believe, and this is a part of a Christian worldview, if I really believe that I have the answer through Christ, how can I not share that with the people around me? And I promise you, will you get some weird looks? Yep. Will you have some weird conversations? Absolutely. Will there be people who don't like you sharing your faith? 100%. Now, how you share it is important. You don't whack them over the head with it. But you have to do more than just living a Christian life in front of people. That leads us to our last thought this morning. From one beggar to another. From one beggar to another. Someone once said this, that evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Evangelism, the sharing of our faith, is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Bread. Now, let me give you, real quick, a little bit of a testimony. I'm a beggar. There was a point in my life where I came to realize that I couldn't fix my own problems, that I couldn't do anything about my own sin. And I had to come to Christ as a beggar, saying, God, I can't do it. I don't have the power in me to be good enough to get to you. And so I had to come to Christ on my face and say, There's a God, and it's you, and it's not me, as a beggar. And in that, as one beggar to another beggar, I want to remind you of this too. That you were in the same boat I was in, that you're a beggar too, that you can't do it on your own. And maybe you're here this morning as a Christian. It's good to be reminded that we're beggars. It's good to be reminded that we couldn't get to Christ on our own, that it's all through His grace and that we should extend that grace to other people but maybe you're here this morning and you realize you know what I am in that same boat I'm in that same boat I need a cure I've come to realize that God made everything perfect that we messed it up and that we need a cure well can I remind you this morning that there is a cure for your sin and your sorrow and your shame and your guilt 
that I needed it and I found it and I still need the grace of God day to day as I fall and mess up and have to repent. But I have to share it with you as well. And so maybe today you realize that you need the Lord from one beggar to another. Would you taste and see that the Lord is good? Would you come to him today as a needy sinner and repent and say, God, you know what? I know I'm a sinner, but today I'm going to place my trust in you. I'm going to accept the work that Christ did on my behalf. I'm going to repent, change my mind the way that I see sin, and I'm going to trust and lean on you for all the days of my life. Would you be willing to do that this morning? The grace of God, the cross, paints everything in crystal clarity. Now, as we close, I want to read a poem to you. It's by Lucy Shaw. It's called Craftsman. I think it's a great way to close out. It's, it says this. It says, Carpenter's son, carpenter's son, is the wood fine and smoothly sanded or rough-grained lying along your back? Was it well-planed? Did they use a plumb line when they set you up? Is the angle true? Why do they choose such dark, expensive stain to gloss the timbers next to your feet and fingers? You should know who Joseph trained, judged all trees for special service. Carpenter's son, carpenter's son, were the nails new and cleanly driven when the dark hammer sang? Is the earth warped from where you hang? Is it high enough for a worldview? And I'm here to tell you this morning that the cross elevates us to a place where we see the entire world, all of reality, in crystal clarity. And it's only through that cross and that grace of Jesus that we come to know him as Savior and that we can find our way back. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for allowing us to be here in your house. Lord, as a, as a beggar, I'm thankful for the grace that you freely bestow upon us. Lord, I'm thankful for your goodness. I'm thankful for your kindness. I'm thankful for your love. Lord, for those of us that know you, would you remind us this morning of our daily need for your grace because we mess up daily. But Lord, would you also remind us of our need to, one, share that grace with other people who don't know about it, but also to extend that grace to people in our lives that mess up. Lord, for those of us that are here that we don't know you, Lord, might today be the day that we trust you and that we receive this grace that you promise can cover all of our sins. Lord, we want you to know that we love you and that we praise you. Be with us. All these things we pray in your name. Amen. Hurt 
Cheers today. You need to know the out, two outside sections are going to be, they're going to go away. We're going to leave these three sections. We have a funeral in just a little while, but we're also taking down the last three rows in the back. So if you could help us with that, it'd be terrific. Thank you so much. See you guys next week.